Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Thank. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah al-aliyyil azim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. Wa alih al-tayyibin al-tahirin la siyama baqiyyat Allah fil aradin. أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الفهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك منشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله في توفيق to continue our study of introduction to نحج البلاغ آية الله متحري Rahmatullah alayhi continues his discussion about theology in Nahjul Balagha. He says, unless we make a comparison between the logic and approach of Nahjul Balagha to such issues in theology and other sources and other schools of thought and philosophy we would not understand the value of discussions in Nahjul Balagha. Comparison helps a lot. And he says, we cannot have, you know, very uh, uh, expanded discussion. We gave you already some examples, some topics of theology under the uh, light of Nahj al and now he wants to make a comparison. He says the style, the method of Nahj al in dealing with divine essence and divine qualities is very uh, special, very uh, new. Even for centuries it remained new. And unrivaled and it's only possible to uh, understand this with the help of the Quran the Quran inspired Amir al Mu'mineen in having such deep and new ways of dealing with theological issues some people who were surprised by seeing such depths and novelty they said these are not words of uh, you know Ali ibn Abi Talib these are said many centuries later by some philosophers or these are you know taken from Greek philosophers but he says whoever is familiar with philosophy Islamic philosophy and Greek philosophy cannot accept this because if you know what was discussed in philosophy at that time or even for centuries afterward you would see that these are totally different or some people think for example uh, these are words of Mu'tazilites later and falsely or intentionally they are attributed to Imam Ali but he says no there are big differences with the Mu'tazilite ideas and even if there are in some issues similarities, so you must say that Mu'tazilites have learned from Imam Ali because although in Nahj al you don't have uh, chains of narrators documented, in other places these are all documented and also there are many other hadiths from Amir al munim which are documented and we are sure that they go back to that time. We cannot say no, these hadiths have, have no history and all of a sudden Sayyidah Razi came and said this is said by Ali ibn Abi Talib no we have many many clear records before Sayyidah Razi rahmatullah what he did as we said in the beginning was not to bring all of a sudden and you know from vacuum this hadith was 
that he selected and put them together as a book in three parts sermons letters white sayings otherwise these hadiths were there before so as an example the issue of qualities of God if you remember when we had introduction to Kalam we discussed this and also in this course I said before Amirul Mu'minin denies qualities of God which are additional to his essence you know he says Kamalul Ikhlas if you want to perfectly make him one and consider him as one you should negate any qualities what does it mean does it mean that he has no sefa of course he has sefa it means nothing additional because there was an idea that they thought qualities of God are additional to his essence like us our knowledge is different from our essence we can gain it we can lose it but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge power life etc are the same as each uh, the same as each other and the same as the essence existentially the only difference is the concept we don't have few beings the essence and then these qualities Asharites believed in Qudama Thamania eternal things which are Qadim according to Asharites were essence of God and seven qualities so they believe in eight eternal things for them we have Zat a sense and then we have knowledge we have power we have Sam Basar Erada Hayat etc Mu'tazilites denied this but they denied qualities altogether they said God has no Sefa and there is only niyab means he acts like someone who has knowledge he behaves for example like someone who has power but he doesn't have knowledge he doesn't have power there is a poem uh, Ayatollah Mutahari mentions al ashariyu bizdiyadin qa'ila wa qala bin niyabat al mu'tazila Ash'ari believes in ziyada, means additional qualities. Mu'tazilites believe in niyaba, means essence replaces or is, you know, filling the gap of qualities. Means he doesn't have qualities. Ayatollah Mutai says, compare this to what Amir al muminin says in Nahjul Balagh. Amir al muminin says, God does not have additional qualities. God does not have limited qualities. His knowledge is not limited. He has infinite knowledge. When an infinite essence has infinite quality, they should be identical. This is what we call Tawheed Safati, to unity with respect to essence. And unit uh, sorry, with respect to attributes, Tawheed Zati with essence. Tawhid Safadi, unity with respect to attributes, which means that all the attributes and the essence are identical existentially, the differences in concepts. So, big, big difference between what Am Amir al Munin says and what Mu'tazilites came to say later. Or, for example, about Kalam, a speech of God. You remember in the course Introduction to Kalam, we said one of the first serious discussion in Kalam was about a speech of God. And some people say maybe the science of Kalam is called Kalam because it was discussing this issue of a speech of God, word of God. Some people have other saying, for example, they say the reason is because they used to say Kalamuna fi kada, or you know, a speech in this it means what we say about this, what we say about that. Uh, so about word of God, speech of God, or chalam of God, Amirul Mumini has very deep saying. 
He says, يَقُولُ لِمَنْ أَرَادَ كَوْنَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُنْ Whatever and whomsoever he wants to create, he says, be, and there it is. But when he, we say, for example, the Quran says, إِنَّمَا أَمْرُهُ إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا and يَقُولَ لَهُ كُنْ Or here he says, يَقُولُ لِمَنْ أَرَادَ كَوْنَهُ كُنْ when we say he says kun, this he says is not like me and you saying kun. La bsautin yakara wa la binida in yusma. It's not with a sound which comes or with a you know call which is heard. Wa innama kalamu subhana fi'lun minhu insha'u. His word is his action. This is our analysis. We analyze the process by saying that there is will, there is you know call, there is fail, etc. But his actions and his decisions cannot be taking time, cannot come gradually. He cannot, you know, be thought as someone who says uh, something, you know, be, and then after that something is created. No. So look at how Amir al looks at this issue of divine word, divine speech, and then he says this is something that is the action of our God and didn't exist before existence of this thing, and if it existed eternally then it would be another god if this was eternal then it would become a second lord a second god so this is what you find deeply philosophical in natural balagha and even many mutakallameen you know struggled and they couldn't find the balance many of them also, he refers to the issue of hostokop aqli, rational or intellectual goodness and badness, and he says, you know, many theologians, even philosophers, use this not only in social ethics or ethics of human beings, even they have taken it to the issue of taqween and, you know, what God does. But he says, in Nahjul Balagha, you don't find any reference to this principle. I mean, Romney didn't have this principle, uh, you know, as a point of reference, he didn't find this to be doing what others thought may do. He didn't find it very appropriate for understanding the way God, you know, operates. Then he, after comparing with some mutakallamin's uh, ideas, theological ideas, then he talks about philosophical ideas, and he says, you know, some people have said maybe these are taken from Greek philosophers. And intentionally or unintentionally are attributed to Mawani, he says no. He says not only it's not from Greek philosophy, even not from Muslim philosophers, even for if you go centuries forward and you reach people like Farabi and then Ibn Sina and then Khaja Nasiruddin Tusi, if you come all the way up to Khaja Nasiruddin Tusi you find some of the things that Amirul Mu'minin says is not highlighted in their philosophy. And it is when Mullah Sadra comes and, you know, brings a revolution and, you know, re, uh, rival in Islamic philosophy by introducing transcendent philosophy, Ahmadul Muta'aliya, and, you know, storing again everything in a new order and with new concepts and new principles you see that now he has many ideas that reflect natural balagh and he refers here to an article by Allah Tabatabai Rahmatullah Alai and he says Hazrat Ustad Allāmi tabā tabā'i ruhi fidā. 
unfortunately some people when they refer to their teachers they don't mention the name of teacher even in the footnote they don't say this is from for example my teacher from his book at all Ayatollah Mutahari not only mentions his teacher but not in the footnote in the text and look at the way he refers to his teacher Hazrat Ustad Allamiyya Taba Taba'i Ruhi Fida May my soul be his ransom and he really meant this he didn't this was not tar off this is not you know something that normally we say about people if he says ruhi feda it means that in his heart he was happy to give his life so that allah metabatabai can live longer i just few days ago because now we are actually in the, you know and we have just had the anniversary of the demise of Allah Metabatabai. I read just a few days ago uh, that the late uh, Allah Metabatabai and Ayatollah Mutahari uh, were together in uh, one of the cities in the province of Khurasan. I forgot was Fariman or another city because Ayatollah Mutahari was from Fariman. In one city, I don't remember exactly. And Ayatollah Nuri Hamadani, who is one of our Maraja today, he says, I was there. And I saw them uh, there, Allame and Ayatollah Mutahari. And he says, the way Ayatollah Mutahari was respecting Allame was exceptional. And he says, when Allame wanted to make wudu, Ayatollah Mutahari was holding his Abba, his Imam, you know, like a child helping his old father. Although he himself a great alim, maybe many people knew him more than Allah in the public, not in the Hose. But he was so polite, so humble before Allah, you know, and keeping um, uh, Abba, you know, the cloak of Allah, um, uh, uh, Allah, the Imam, the turban of Allah, and then when Allah finished and put it on his head, he says, I was surprised with this level of politeness of Ayatollah Mutahari. Or how Allah was a, with his teacher. And he says, you know, a person offered perfume to Allah Metabatabai, and he said, after Ayatollah Qazi, my teacher, has passed away, I have not used perfume. And he said by that time, I think he says two years or something had passed, and maybe later also. He was not using perfume. So, this is the love they had, the appreciation they had for teachers, and we should also show the same, because they are also our teachers. They are, maybe they are not our immediate teachers, but when it is teacher of teacher of teacher, it becomes even more important. So this is a key to success. If you want tawfiq for learning especially, you have to be grateful to Allah and to your teachers and people who are channels of knowledge. So anyway, after this, he says that Allah metabatabai in an article in a journal, Maktab Tashayyuh, which was published in Qom, two famous journals were published in Qom before revolution. One was Maktab Islam, one was Maktab Tashayyuh. So, in Maktab Tashayyuh, Allame in the second article in the issue number two, or issue number two of the journal, says that. These ideas that we find in our hadith about theology were not known to Muslims, were not known to Arabs before Islam, and you don't find in uh, works of philosophers in other places which were translated into Arabic. You don't find them in the works of Muslim philosophers, Arabs and non-Arabs, 
and they are totally new and for some centuries remained untouched. <laughs> Maybe people repeated them, but they didn't understand them. It didn't become an issue in their discourse, a topic that they discussed. And he says this continued till the 11th century. So for about 1000 years, till these issues like Vahdat Haqqe, you remember we said that oneness of God is not numeric. Or, for example, the fact that existence of God and unity, Vahda, are Musawiq. This is philosophical term, means they come together and they come from the same aspect. Oneness and existence for God are coming together and are two sides of the same coin. Or, for example, the fact that everything is known by God and God is known by himself. Because before that, everyone tried to prove existence of God by using different things. Even Ibn Sina, who thinks that he has found Burhan al-Siddiqin, and he says that Burhan al-Siddiqin is the one that you come to God directly and you prove the existence of God directly. But in reality, his Burhan, his proof for existence of God, is still is not that direct. It's mostly a matter of Burhan al-Wujub al-Imkan and uses the concept of Wujub, which is good, but still is not direct. Because he doesn't explain why God is wajib is necessary it is mullah sadra who later introduces burhan siddiqin and uses the concept of absolute being which is god without referring to any creature or any contingent being so that he can come to god so these are the things that are in nahjul balagh and up to time of mullah sadra were not that much uh, discussed even by people like Ibn Sina who was a great philosopher and thinker and fully aware of uh, philosophical heritage of Greece and Greek philosophers and Muslims and you know other per per Persia etc you know in the medieval ages they used to refer to works of Ibn Sina and other Muslims to understand Greek philosophy and later they were directly translated from Greek to Latin but before that it was through Arabic he says Hazrat Ustad I don't know how we can translate Hazrat in uh, English it's very difficult maybe you can say you know his eminence teacher my teacher he says, referring to a hadith from Imam Ali, which is in Tawheed by Shaykh al Sadduq, says that the basis of this point in this hadith, which is from Imam Ali, is that the existence of God is unlimited because it's absolute reality. And whatever is unlimited, whatever is absolute, is free from need and everything else relies on him but he doesn't rely on anything in any case he says what is in Nahj al which is the basis of all discussions about essence of God is that his existence is unlimited it's absolute there is no way to think of any limit for existence of God anything that can limit it can bring a modification for the existence of God. No time, no space, no quality can limit his existence. Time, space, number, quantity, quality, all these things that can limit, they come later in the actions, in the things that he creates. 
not in his essence and not in his essential qualities. Then he refers to theological ideas or ideas about God in Western theosophy. You know, even Western thinkers were believers who were using philosophy, but with theological commitments or with, you know, faith in God in their mind and heart. He said, unfortunately, they faced problem, many problems, because they were not well prepared for dealing with these deep questions. For example, he says, if you study the ontological uh, argument of Saint Anselm, which is very famous, and then what you know, people like Leibniz, Spinoza, you know, Descartes, all have said about God, and compare it to what is in Nahjul Balagh and later developed by Mullah Sadra, you find a big difference. So how can then someone says, uh, you know, these ideas in Nahjul Balagh are, you know, borrowed from Greek philosophy? Even much later, there is no such similar thing there. So Alhamdulillah, we finished uh, this part and he uh, himself also apologizes. He says, uh, I am sorry that the first two parts are very, you know, technical, but this is the way we have to understand Nahjul Balagh and very important part of Nahjul Balagh is these deep uh, you know, questions. But inshallah from next session, we will talk about Suluk wa Ibadat. It's about worshipping Allah and about our conduct and how we can, you know, get closer to Allah, how spirituality and, and you know, wayfaring are uh, reflected in Nahjul Balagh. Very beautiful discussions we have about worship, about degrees of worshippers, what is Imam Ali's understanding of worship, about worship of the free people, Ahrar, about their conditions, about how they appreciate night and ibadah in night, about, you know, tahajjud and about the things that occur to their hearts, about ibadah as a medicine, as a remedy, and about, you know, being acquainted with ibadah. Inshallah, these are the things that in the next section of uh, the book we will discuss. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the souls of all our teachers and all our ulama who have great rights upon us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve for us those who are alive and give them, inshallah, healthy and tawfiq and lots of, inshallah, opportunities to keep uh, in reaching our minds and hearts, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam. Alhamdulillah, thank you. The very good, uh, very good examples we're giving of the respect uh, between Ayatollah Matahari and Allah Mataba Tabai. May Allah bless their souls. Inshallah. We have a question from today and a question from last week. Maybe I'll start with the one from last week. Um, and it was regarding the Burhan that was mentioned. Um, and I think you quoted a Quranic verse about if there were two gods, La uh, Fasadata. So this question is basically saying, is there a conceptual impossibility in having two gods that agree with each other? And how can we discuss the impossibility of having two gods that agree with each other? Yeah. Yeah, as a, we have said uh, in discussions about Aqa'id, the way we articulate this Burhan is not that they would fight with each other. Some people, you know, discuss, mention in that way, that if there were two gods, you know, they would have, you know, fought with each other. And then some people say, okay, why, uh, what happens if they don't fight with each other? We can uh, discuss that approach, but we have totally different approach. And I think I briefly mentioned 
actually in that session but more detailed uh, are uh, available in our discussions about Tawheed in Aqa'id basically what we say is that if there were two lords then each of them with their own creation would be separate from each other there are two problems and one is how we can have two infinite beings this is one problem but the problem of is that when there were two separate worlds without interaction between them then this system that we see would not be possible this order would not be possible so if for example r rain was coming from one god and the earth belonged to another god how can then rain t uh, reach the earth if one star one planet was one belonging to one god another so how can the light of that one come to here as i i think mentioned that if something is in my mind and something in your mind they cannot interact a car in my mind cannot give a lift to a passenger in your mind because what is in your mind depends on you what is in my mind depends on me they cannot interact so this is the way we articulate burhan tamanu' law kana fi ma'adatun la fasadat Yeah, welcome. Uh, we have another question. I've just put it up on the screen. Um, it says, Salam, is this work mostly hidden related to a unique relation between st student and teacher? Uh, if I understand the question correctly, it's speaking about the student teacher relationship and whether it is mostly hidden or is it open and in the public? Um, if that's what you understand from the question as well, Sheikh. This work, which work? So I think the sister is asking about the unique relationship between the student and the teacher. Is it mostly hidden or is it uh, in the public? Of course, uh, the main thing is in the heart, uh, but uh, to some extent should be expressed in the public, if I understood the question. So uh, I cannot just love someone in my heart and then don't praise him in the public, don't mention him in the public, don't say I owe him in the public, don't refer people to his work in public. Uh, maybe sometimes, you know, for example, there are situations that, uh, uh, for example, I should, you know, not mention my ustad, you know, too much because they can, you know, uh, some people may feel, you know, I am biased or etc. I don't know, maybe sometimes there are some secondary issues, but for sure, when you are in debt to someone or when you respect someone, when you love someone, when you have benefited from someone and you think other people can benefit, naturally you would uh, mention and praise him in front of other people. Actually, this is a very important requirement of gratitude, that if I have benefited from something, I would also let other people benefit from that. If there is a book which has been beneficial for me and I am grateful, so I should let other people also benefit from that book. Okay, maybe we can have a quick announcement uh, before we finish off the session with a du 